This is another in the series on finding the engram. In this lesson, we'll focus on new and exciting research using optogenetics. This is a tool that has the potential to really advance our understanding of the engram. Now, in previous lessons, we learned about contextual fear conditioning. And this is a paradigm in which rats are placed in a certain context, like KJ, and given a shock. And then they're returned to their home cage. If they're placed in that same training cage, rats will show a fear response. They will freeze. They will show a fear memory to the context associated with the shock, but not a different context, like a different cage that was never associated with the shock. We said there's uh, evidence that the hippocampus is, is critical for this type of learning. Damage to the hippocampus tends to abolish the association of a context with a shock, so they don't show fear to the training chamber anymore. Well, we know the hippocampus has uh, various uh, uh, structural components, one of which is the dentate gyrus, and that's a region thought to contribute to pattern separation. And pattern separation allows similar experiences or context to be encoded as distinct engrams within the dentate gyrus. And so we should expect then the very different context would activate different hippocampal neurons in the dentate gyrus, whereas very similar contexts would activate a similar set of neurons. Now in the remainder of the lesson, we'll just use a simple diagram like this to help us uh, visualize some cells in the dentate gyrus. For example, we have a population of cells. And due to the uh, pattern separation, when the animal is put in context A, a certain population of cells will become active the pink ones. If you put the animal in a different context, context B, a different population of cells will become active. So we have a different subset of cells that are activated by the different contexts. Now it turns out it is just a fraction of the entire population that responds to a given context. But in any event, repeated exposure to context A activates the same sparse population of dentate gyrus cells and context B activates a distinct population. Now here's the, the new technology. In a technique called optogenetics, researchers can engineer activated neurons to respond to light. When a cell is activated by the current task, the genetically engineered cells make a light-activated protein ion channel that gets inserted into the cell's membrane. Later, the cell's electrical activity can be controlled by applying light to that brain region or that population of cells. The cell can be engineered to respond to the light or be inhibited by, by the light. So in this diagram here, let's say that we put the animal in context B so that the green cells become active. Well, if the animal has been prepared for optogenetics research, these activated cells are now going to start to make a protein, which is this ion channel that gets inserted into its membrane. So the little marks here would be proteins inserted into the membrane. These proteins respond to light. They open up an ion channel and ions go into the cell. And so depending on which protein gets inserted, you can use light to activate the cell or to inhibit the cell. Here is a sort of a simple a diagram of how the procedure works. So with optogenetic techniques, researchers can modulate the activity of targeted neurons using light. Step one, uh, piece together a genetic construct. You've got a promoter to drive gene expression and a gene encoding an opsin. So it's a protein that is light sensitive and it's an ion channel. You insert the, uh, the construct into a virus. You inject the virus into the certain brain region so the opsin is expressed in the targeted neurons. You insert the optrode. So in other words, this is like a little fiber optic sort of cable. And then it has a little electrode. But you can kind of shine light down this fiber optic cable so you can illuminate brain cells. Uh, laser light of a specific wavelength opens the ion channels in the neurons that have that protein inserted into the membrane. And then when that channel opens up, ions rush in. If, they, if sodium rushes in, for example, that's going to stimulate the, uh, uh, the uh, cell. Uh, a different protein can let negatively charged ions in, and that would then inhibit the cell. So here we see a mouse that has the sort of fiber cable inserted uh, into its brain. And this is just an animation showing sort of a neuron here, the cell body, and the little green things here would be these light-activated channels. So when you shine laser light on these channels, they open up and allow ions into the cell, and that can stimulate the cell. So you can control the electrical activity of the cell with light. 
So here's how the technique can be used. Let's say during exposure to context B, only context B neurons will be activated. And because you've engineered them, that's going to trigger protein synthesis and the insertion of light activated ion channels into the cell membrane. So at a later time, shining light on those cells in the dente gyrus will activate only those n-gram neurons for context B. So again, out of, out of the whole population here, we've got some cells, the pink ones, that respond to context A. They get turned on for context A. The green ones get turned on for B. But what you can do is then control when those cells are allowed to insert these light-activated channels. And if you do this uh, in context B, now later you can control the context B cells without having any control over context A, but you can control the context B cells by shining light on them. If you shine light on these cells, no matter where the animal is, these cells will be activated. So consider the following experiment. We're going to have context A will be the safe environment, and context B will be the environment where the animal will receive a shock. So it's going to get trained in context B. Now here's our population again, and here we go. The mouse is habituated in context A. Neurons are allocated to the engram for context A. So the pink cells were active in context A. So that they would, some of them are going to become the engram for the memory of context A, and, but it was a safe uh, place to be. Next, the animal is fear conditioned in context B, and the insertion of light activated proteins occurs in allocated neurons for context B. So here we have the situation where, in context B, we allow the cells to express the, these uh, opsin uh, proteins, and now they will be light activated, so these can be controlled using light. But they are context B cells. Next, the mouse is placed back into context A, the safe context, and the light fiber inserted into the dentate gyrus, as shown here, and that, that the light is turned on and off repeatedly. So as they turn the light on and off, they want to see whether the animal's behavior changes. See, if the light is off, the, it's the context A cells that are active, and that, that is a memory of a safe place. When you turn the light on, the context A cells will still be on because the animal's in context A, but the B cells are now going to be activated. But those B cells were involved in the engram for the fear memory, so they wanted to see whether turning the light on would cause fear. When the light was on, the mice showed more freezing behavior than when the light was off. Stimulating the context B engram neurons caused expression of the fear memory, even though the animal was in a safe context. So you see, when they're in this situation, they're in context A, so the A cells are currently active, but there's no fear associated with context A. Nevertheless, when you turn on the light, now the B cells get turned on, and they were uh, involved in the engram for a fear memory, so the animal shows fear, even though they're in a safe environment. Another experiment showed the context specificity of the engrams. Mice were habituated in context A, as before, then exposed to context B, where they inserted the light active activated channels into their membranes. But they were not trained. They just, in context B, uh, they were just allowed to insert the, the uh, light activated channels. Then they go on to train the animal in context C. So in context C the animal's getting going to get a foot shock. And for our diagram purposes we'll have the, the uh, uncolored uh, cells here be those activated by context C. So next the mice were conditioned uh, in uh, Context C, but those neurons were not allowed to insert light activated channels. So only the engram B neurons were light responsive. During testing in context A, the safe context, activating context B neurons did not produce freezing. This shows that the fear memory is context specific. It was context C engram that was associated with shock, but those context C neurons did not have the light activated channels. Remember, the B cells were activated by context B, and they inserted these uh, channels, but there was no fear associated with context B. So activating the B cells in context A does not produce any fear. You would have to at activate the context C cells to get fear. Now we briefly mentioned that the optogenetic technique can be used to uh, activate cells or inhibit them.
For example, the blue light here can activate cells because uh, it's activating certain protein, the opsin, the uh, the channel word opsin protein, and that's going to allow positively charged ions in like sodium into the cell and that will depolarize the cell and tend to activate the cell. But there are other uh, kinds of proteins that can be inserted into the membrane and these proteins respond to a different color of light and they can allow negatively charged ions into the cell and negatively charged ions are going to hyperpolarize the cell so they're going to inhibit the cell. So the blue light can activate the cells if they have that uh, protein uh, channel. The yellow light can inhibit the cells if they have that other protein channel. So you can control cell activity uh, using light. Now consider one final experiment. Again, using optogenetic techniques, allocated neurons can be engineered to be inhibited by light, as we just saw. Temporarily silencing allocated engram neurons in the hippocampus CA1 region also decreases the expression of fear during testing. This process is reversible, so upon removal of the silencing procedure, the fear memory returns. So in other words, here's our initial population, this time CA1 cells in the hippocampus. You uh, allocate them to fear memory, so you, you train the animal, uh, give it a shock in a certain context, and so you'll get the pink cells here are going to be involved in the engram for the fear. Uh, you allow them to express the, the uh, proteins, the light-activated proteins. So they're going to be engram cells, and you can control them with light. Now, during testing, you silence them. So you shine the yellow light on them, so you hyperpolarize them, you, you inhibit them. These are the very engram cells right, that were allocated during training. But you're going to silence them when you uh, give them the test. So you, you put them in the, in the chamber and they show no fear. So you can block the fear memory by silencing those cells that were allocated to the engram. Thus a memory can be temporarily blocked by inhibiting those engram neurons that are the basis of the memory. Now if the entire hippocampus using other techniques is silenced during the training then no fear memory is formed. And so this shows that the neurons must be activated initially during training for the allocation process to occur. In summary then, optogenetics is a powerful new tool to help track down the engram, to find those cells that actually uh, participate in storing the memory of some event. By genetically engineering these uh, cells to be responsive to light and being able to manipulate them, we can study uh, how cells are allocated to a memory. We can try to erase memories. We can artificially stimulate these cells. Uh, and this uh, is a major advance in helping us understand how memories are stored in the brain.